About one month ago, GQ Britain did an interview with John Boyega where they spoke about a lot of his film projects, as well as his speech during the Black Lives Matter protest in England. Also, as part of this interview, he spoke a lot about his experience working with Lucasfilm in portraying Finn in the Star Wars sequel movie franchise. And that's what we're going to discuss in this video here. Greetings all, this is Harry Nick, and this is probably going to be the hardest video I've ever had to make. Um, it's going to be a lot more somber, it's going to be a lot more slow paced than I usually talk. I'm not going to sort of push my own, you know, Harry Nick persona in this one. I just want to talk frankly about some of these issues because I think it's really important that those of us who have the ability and the platform to do so should. Because it's really easy just to sit here to celebrate Star Wars, um, talk about the tabletop game X-Wing and just have fun with it. But there comes points in a content creator's job where you see what's going on and it feels disingenuous just to talk about plastic ships when that's going on. Um, that's very much what I felt back uh, a couple months ago when I made my video um, in support of Black Lives Matter. And it's how I feel now. Yeah, I know it's a month after this article came out. I know I'm not striking while the iron's hot. Um, but it's something that have been thinking about for quite a while now. And I, I just have to get it out there. I have to talk about this stuff. Um, if that bothers you, sorry, dislike, stop watching the video. That's entirely on you. But look, at the end of the day, I'm not trying to change anyone's uh, opinions. I'm not trying to force my politics onto others. I'm just trying to shine a bit more of a light on this. Um, indeed, I think it's really important to point out on the offset that I have not experienced these things myself. I'm a white guy. Um, I'm not here to validate or invalidate John Boyega's claims or the claims of any uh, persons of colors, black people, um, that are experiencing these kinds of prejudice. I'm just, it's not my place to do that. Um, I'm here to talk more specifically about um, Disney's treatment of like Finn in the sequels, um, talk about the storytelling elements of that. That's something that I feel like I am qualified to talk about. But yeah, look, don't use this video as the be all and end all like, oh, this is what Black Lives Matter is important about. No. If you watch this video and you're interested in the things I'm talking about and you're interested about learning more, listen to the black community when it comes about these issues. Read John Boyega's interview with GQ. Watch the video interview he did, which is like a supplemental thing. That actually, the video interview and the written interview are different. So if you're going to engage with this, read and watch both of those things. Uh, watch his speech at the Black Lives Matter protest. It is very, very powerful. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's full on. It's really full on. And I, I don't know. We just can't sit here and pretend this isn't going on. I, I know people in response to me talking about this kind of stuff have accused me of, oh, you're injecting politics into Star Wars. And first of all, Star Wars by its very nature is a political um, set of movies. It's about war. In any case, what you have to appreciate is it's all very well um, for someone like me or someone like you to say, hey, I don't want to engage with politics when I uh, watch Star Wars movies or watch X-Wing videos or whatever. But people like John Boyega don't have that choice. That's the problem. Race politics is affecting them negatively, whether they choose to engage in it or not. And that's why they're sick of it. That's why they're having these protests. That's why he made that speech in the Black Lives Matter protest. So I just want to encourage people to say, hey, all you've got to do is maybe not click on a YouTube video that I put out every now and then. But people like John Boyega don't have the choice not to engage in this kind of stuff. So just keep that in mind. If you don't want to watch these kind of videos, then don't. I'm not going to force people to do it. I'm not even going to tell people to say to subscribe to my channel if they feel like this is an egregious offstep for my kind of content. At the end of the day, it's my channel. I'll make what I want. Uh, you don't have to stick around if you don't want to. All I ask that is if you do like the content I make, subscribe. Otherwise, you do you. I'm absolutely cool with that. So we're going to take a look at this article. We're going to look at some of the key points here. And again, I'm not trying to uh, like analyze the claims that John's making. I'm not trying to say, hey, you're right or wrong. I'm not John Boyega. He is the best person to decide his own experience. I can't believe I have to qualify that statement, but um, I am seeing various comments from people saying, hey, this, this isn't true. This isn't about race. I'm like, are you 
John Boyega, can you really make that claim? Anyway, um, conveniently uh, in this GQ article, it actually does highlight um, a lot of the claims um, in these bold sections. You know, they're usually to do with the experience he had with Star Wars, um, the way they've highlighted those quotes, because of course that's what's going to propagate and um, sell the article when they talk about Star Wars. It's a huge franchise after all. And it just so happens to be the points that I want to talk about. As I said, there are um, discussions on other projects he's done and other facets of his life, but that's not the content of this video. Indeed, I actually want to start with this quote that was put uh, in the heading of the article. Um, the only cast member whose experience of Star Wars was based on their race. And this is just going to be the one point where I say, hey, I understand you're hurting man, but let's not forget what Kelly Marie Tran went through after The Last Jedi. Um, that was a result of her being seen as a uh, token minority include um, uh, the fact that she was a female Asian character within the Star Wars universe. That sort of grinded a lot of people's gears because, you know, imagine that, a, a female Asian character in a movie with aliens and laser swords and stuff like that. They're just the gall of it. Um, but... When I say that, I'm not trying to um, discredit John Boyega's claim here. I mean, obviously, the fact that one other person, at the very least, um, also had a negative experience because of race politics uh, during the production of the Star Wars sequel trilogy doesn't discredit his claim whatsoever. Um, and also, in defense of John here, um, it's very easy when you are the subject of prejudice to feel like you are alone in that suffering. Um, so I, I, I don't think what he's saying is necessarily wrong here. I mean, and the article actually does go on to talk more specifically about his experience, and that is very much what John Boyega went through. So obviously, in context, this statement makes a lot more sense when you read the whole article. Um, but I do just want to call that out. Um, in any case, the fact that any person should have a negative experience during the filming of a movie because of their race is frankly absurd. Um, Needless to say, white people don't experience that. It's just crazy. But um, the article actually goes on, and it's more towards the bottom here. I'll bring it up on the screen. Yep, here it is uh, near the bottom of the article. Uh, nobody else in the cast had people saying they were going to boycott the movie because they were in it. Nobody else had an uproar of death threats sent to their Instagram DMs and social media saying, black this and black that, and you shouldn't be a stormtrooper. Uh, nobody else had that experience, but yet people are surprised that I'm this way. It's frustrating. And I think it raises a very good point. Um, you can see when John's doing that Black Lives Matter speech, you can see that really raw emotion that he's been sort of keeping because he wasn't able to talk openly about this while he was working for Disney. I, I look at that and I compare that to the comments of people saying, oh, this is just being blown out of proportion and whatever. I'm like, just... Guys, just listen to the guy. Just listen to him. He can't accurately force you to see the way he's saying, but he's trying his damn best here. I mean, getting death threats because you are a certain race and you're in somebody's pet film franchise. I want to remind people that Star Wars is really, really cool. Really cool. It's not special, though. It's another film franchise. Um, I personally love a lot of different film franchises, Star Wars being one of my favourites, admittedly, but um, the, the way we sort of hold Star Wars on this pedestal, um, and you can see it, you can see it based on the reaction of like things like The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker and how people are... You know, tried to petition Disney to remove, like, The Last Jedi from the film canon and all that kind of stuff. People have arrived at this point where what happens or what doesn't happen in the Star Wars universe is uh, one of the most important things in their lives. And at the end of the day, it's just storytelling. But storytelling is a lot of things to a lot of different people. If you're getting to the stage where simply somebody who represents a minority um, being in a film like Star Wars bothers you, well, I think you just need to stop and evaluate why you are engaging in that franchise in the first place. I think it does get to the stage where things can be a bit unhealthy at that point. Um, in any case, yeah, obviously sending people death threats for just about any reason is morally reprehensible, so... I shouldn't have to highlight that point, but um, 
Here we are. Okay, here's the next quote I want to talk about. What I say to Disney is do not market a black character as important and then push them aside. Um, this is a very interesting point, and this talks a lot about how Finn was treated and his arc over the three films, and it's something that I really want to highlight here. Um, so this harkens back to one of the problems with the advertisement during the lead-up to The Force Awakens, uh, Disney's first Star Wars movie when they bought the franchise off of George Lucas. We had this situation where we were shown um, trailers about The Force Awakens and about uh, Finn and Rey and where their character arcs were seemingly going to go. And they did this thing that they do with all their Star Wars movies where they... They sort of, um, they make you think something's going to go in one direction and they take it in another direction for the sake of dramatic effect and yeah, usually works quite well. Uh, one of the problems, uh, one of the big problems was um, they didn't show um, Ray's potential or they didn't show um, accurately where Ray was going to head um, in that she was force sensitive, you know, wield a lightsaber and is actually quite a competent lightsaber fighter. Um, all that kind of stuff to do with The Force Awakens. They actually showed Finn's character as the one wielding the lightsaber and he was going to be uh, the Luke Skywalker of this franchise, or at least that's sort of like the red herring they sent you on. And, um, of course, when that wasn't the case, uh, people sort of viewed that as a negative thing towards Finn. I actually think, from my personal take on that, a character who is not naturally Force-sensitive, taking up the lightsaber and taking on Kylo Ren was actually... A really powerful moment for Finn. It was actually a really good um, direction to take that character in. It was very unique as well. Um, for a movie that was very derivative of another Star Wars movie, I actually quite liked that moment. Um, it was very, very powerful. Um, and I've actually read a lot of comments from people um, in the lead up to making this video saying, hey, making Finn not Force-sensitive was a bad move for his character. It, like, I think... Uh, characters don't have to be Force-sensitive to be um, viewed as powerful or relevant in Star Wars. In fact, I think the fact that, as I said, he's not Force-sensitive but still chose to um, take up the lightsaber and do what he did as being a very powerful moment. And of course, you've got characters like uh, Padme or Han Solo or Chewie, or all these characters that aren't Force-sensitive that are very, very important to the franchise. Um, so... I don't believe that Finn not being Force-sensitive is an insult to him or his character. Um, but it's sort of where it went after that point. The article talks a lot about The Last Jedi and the creative choices that they took Finn on there. And I agree, this is sort of where the character sort of starts to fall apart a bit. My biggest criticism of Finn in The Last Jedi was he largely goes on the same character arc that he went through in The Force Awakens. Um, in The Force Awakens, he starts off as a deserting stormtrooper. Um, he is very fearful of the First Order. You, you might cynically suggest he's quite cowardly, although I think Finn would argue he's being a realist at that point. And he arrives at the end point of The Force Awakens where he takes up the lightsaber against Kylo Ren. He's saying, nope, I, I'm done running. Blah, blah, blah. Here I go. I'm... I'm a powerful character, I'm a relevant character, and um, he enters a coma at the end of the movie and wakes up in The Last Jedi, where he basically starts on the same arc again. He starts where he just wants to run away from the First Order, which would be fine if he didn't already have that character arc come to a very powerful conclusion in the previous movie. Um, and to his credit, he arrives at the same point again where he takes on and ultimately... Um, spoiler alert for The Last Jedi or The Rise of Skywalker before I continue. Right, they're all gone? Cool. Um, he arrives at a point where he uh, kills Captain Phasma. A very, very powerful moment. Um, not a very strong character moment for Captain Phasma, but uh, an alright moment for Finn. Um, but it's the clumsiness of him going through that arc again. There is also another moment in The Last Jedi that kind of bothers me with Finn's character. Um, Finn and Rose go on this sub-quest together uh, where they have to go to the Canto Bight and ultimately Snoke's um, Star Destroyer. Is, is it a Star Destroyer? I don't know. Through that story, uh, Finn learns a lot from Rose. Rose becomes, in some ways, kind of a mentor character for Finn. 
Um, but unfortunately, I don't think this was done with enough nuance that really served Finn's character. Um, Rose, in one scene, uh, shows Finn, like, oh, look, the glitz and glamour of Canto Bite looks amazing, but hey, focus on this thing. Hey, look, there's there's slave children down there. You know, this is all wonderful when you look at it on the surface, but, you know, you've got to appreciate what's going on. These people are suffering. Um, and I felt like when I originally saw that, that was a, it was a moment of ignorance for Finn's character, which I just don't think really gelled well. I feel like those two characters should have been aware of that together and gone through that realization together. Um, the fact that one was sort of explaining to the other one, like, hey, th this is the reality that's going on. You know, Finn's character was put into servitude. He was forced to become a stormtrooper against his will. And for him to not appreciate that from the offset, for him to be the more ignorant one, in that moment in the story, it felt clumsy. I mean, the Canto Bite sequence feels clumsy overall. Um, in terms of the way it was written. But that moment in particular, I felt was a weak moment for Finn and a weak choice um, for his character to go on. Ultimately, you have these two films, The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, where Finn goes on that arc twice. And we arrive at The Rise of Skywalker, where Finn is this emboldened character. It's, it's so weird because the trajectory all of a sudden jumps to a part where he is a natural born leader um, and it feels clumsy even arriving there, even though that this is a very positive move for the character because it's almost like J.J. Um, Abrams just decided to make Finn um, end up where he always wanted him to end up and ignore what uh, Ryan Johnson did in The Last Jedi. Now, I realize people are largely unhappy with the direction taken The Last Jedi. That's fine. We're all entitled to our opinions. Um, but the fact that both directors ultimately looked back at the previous work and largely veered away from it, I don't think either of those uh, tactics are a good thing. I don't think JJ going, oh, well, let's, let's just ignore The Last Jedi and, and, you know, arrive where I wanted to arrive and just, you know, just completely <laughs> veer the story in this direction again. I don't think that was the right choice. And I think out of all the characters, Finn's is the one that suffered the most. It just sucks that he was sort of caught in the middle of all of that. That's really a negative thing. I, I really don't want to add to the discussion, which is just dogging on The Last Jedi. I'm, I'm really tired of talking about that movie. It, um, it, it genuinely exhausts me um, every time I mention it in passing and there's comments in my videos going, oh, I loved it, Ryan Johnson ruined the whole Star Wars universe. I, I'm not here to add to that discussion. It's it's frankly not interesting to me. Um, but when we're talking about this kind of stuff, um, I kind of have to, and that's understandable. Um, I can't ignore that part of the discussion just because it makes me feel more comfortable. That would be dishonest. And actually, just on that discussion... Um, Something I notice a lot of people do, they either point to Disney or they point to Ryan Johnson or Kathleen Kennedy. They point to any one of these entities and say, ha, this is the thing that ruined the Star Wars universe. This is the, this is the reason that John Boyega has gone through so much injustice and prejudice. And I want to encourage people to try and look at the bigger picture because when we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, when we're talking about racism in general, we're talking about something that is systematic. Um, you can say that one person ruined uh, The Last Jedi as much as you want, but you have to appreciate that all of these things are essentially made by committee. There are a lot of people that have to sign off on these movies. Disney is not one collective hive mind. It's a lot of people trying to please a lot of other people, um, trying to produce movies and make a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Ultimately, you have to remember that. And when we look at that and we realize that there's a lot of different individuals, a lot of people making these decisions, it harkens back to when we filter down what's best for everyone. It's the systematic problems that become more pervasive. It's the systematic problems that rear their ugly head when some people have to sign off on the same thing. Um, I just want to encourage people to say, hey, it's not Disney. It's the culture surrounding this in its entirety. It's not just Star Wars this is happening with. It's it's all film franchises. It's um, 
it's our cultural perception of people of color in general. It's happening all around the world, guys. It's it's not just Star Wars. So that's just something I want people to reflect on whenever they say those kinds of things. Okay, there's one more major talking point I want to talk about from this article. Uh, it's this quote here. You guys knew what to do with Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver. When it came to me, you knew fuck all. Um, <clears throat> which is an interesting point. Um, of course, Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver being the two sort of white protagonists slash antagonists. And it is fair. Um, these two characters suffered the least from the um, the scripting and story direction problems I mentioned before. I think arguably Ray does suffer from one big issue in terms of her storytelling. Um, it's the same thing Aragorn suffers from in The Lord of the Rings. I think she's too benevolent too much of the time. I never really believed she was going to turn to the dark side, apart from when we were watching the trailers for the films. Um, she was always that voice of reason, that voice of good, and there wasn't, in my mind, a lot of conflict within the character. That's the only real criticism I have for her. But in the case of Kylo Ren with Adam Driver's character, a very well-nuanced character, I really enjoyed Kylo. He is absolutely one of my favorite characters in the sequel trilogy. Um, I, I love the arc he goes on over all three films. Um, I think his turn to the light side at the end of The Rise of Skywalker... I think it was better done than like Anakin's turn to the dark side at the end of episode three. And I was very happy with the treatment of his character overall. Um, ben Solo or Kylo Ren worked. Now, again, there was problems with the direction of the storytelling um, from movie to movie. And I think um, the only big problem he suffered was um, he his speech about telling Rey that she is Palpatine's granddaughter... Um, was a huge contradiction to what he said in The Last Jedi. I know the whole thing was meant to be, well, I said this, but I really meant this. It's very clear in The Last Jedi, the way they presented that, that's not what he was intending to do. He wasn't trying to mislead Rey. He was genuinely trying to say to her, you are nobody. Um, but that's not really something relating to Kylo's character. That's more relating to the main plot line overall. So I don't think that spoils the character. I just think it's not brilliant writing, if I'm to be honest. Um, but it is true. I, I think these two characters were generally quite well written. I think the arc is very well defined across three films. That's the big difference between these characters and Finn. Um, I, I like where Ray starts and ends. I like where uh, Kylo starts and ends. Um, and that's cool. You know, bumps along the way. It's not the perfect storytelling, not by a long stretch. Um, but I would agree in general with this um, argument. Indeed, I don't think any of these characters went on a story arc as well as like Luke Skywalker in the original trilogy. I think that is brilliant writing. Um, I know I um, do go on about the original trilogy and how I think it was by far the best and uh, don't like the prequels and all that kind of stuff. Whatever, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, but I think that is a great example of good storytelling. I think... Um, Luke in all three of those original movies has a clear defined character that is different but the same and well developed across all three and um, I particularly love in like Return of the Jedi how he becomes like this really powerful Jedi but immediately after they leave Tatooine he goes to see Yoda again he he gains that conflict again because of the discussion with Yoda, the discussion about how he has to deal with the fact that Vader's his father. It's really, really powerful because you've got a character that has arrived at a point where they are all powerful and all that kind of stuff, but they still manage to keep conflict. Um, I, I love the writing of Luke Skywalker. I love the writing of Luke Skywalker in all the films he's um, appeared in. I actually quite liked what they did with him in The Last Jedi. Not the discussion of this video. I know a lot of you are typing really angrily on the keyboard right now going, oh, they ruined his character. Sure, that's cool. You're allowed to have that opinion. I'm not saying that. But just for the sake of this discussion, I think the best way to sort of appreciate what's happened to Finn is particularly looking at his treatment as opposed to like um, Adam Driver or Mark Hamill's treatment in their respective trilogies. And you can kind of say, hey, it does feel like this character, although there was problems overall with the sequel, it seems like this character suffered the most, or arguably the most. Again, I want to bring up Kelly Marie Tran, um, because, hey, uh, her character was made completely irrelevant in the third movie after having a prominent spot 
in the second movie, but that certainly doesn't um, weaken the argument overall. Um, I think um, John Boyega makes an excellent point when he brings up his comparison with these other characters. And obviously, and obviously he's going to talk directly about them because he worked with them in this film trilogy. So that's all the talking points I want to bring up um, in this particular article. Um, I strongly encourage all of you to read it, um, to look at the video interview as well. Um, as I said, talks about other projects, talks about um, his experience as a black man and his upbringing in general. Um, it's not really my place to discuss that kind of stuff, as I said before. Um, but I did want to make a video, highlight the importance of talking about this, um, being a signal booster for this kind of stuff. It's important not just for those who are suffering the effects of these uh, kinds of prejudices to speak up, but also those who are not. Um, it's important to say, hey, like, this isn't fair, even though this doesn't affect me. Um, I'm not here to talk specifically about those experiences. Again, listen to people of color when it comes to these kind of things. You can still arrive at the conclusion that you don't agree with them, but at least, at least listen to them. Um, that's sort of the big message I want to get across in this video. In the description down below, I will link a video to John Boyega's uh, full speech during the Black Lives Matter protest, uh, his interview with GQ, both written and video form. And if any of you know of some good material I should be linking down there, let me know in the comments and I'll add them in um, because I want to keep this conversation going. I think it's important. I'm not trying to be the be all and end all when it comes to this discussion. I am just keeping it going because we have to work on this because we as Star Wars fans are better than this. There's no two ways about it. Um, I choose to be optimistic. I choose to say, hey, things will get better if we keep working at it. And I'm <laughs> relentless in my optimism. So there it is. That's all I want to say. We're better than this.